This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with Los Angeles County Museum of Art curator Diva Samaya about the new exhibit, The World Made Wondrous, The Dutch Collector's Cabinet in the Politics of Possession, on display now through March 3rd of next year. Samaya, who is the assistant curator of European painting and sculpture at LACMA, has brought together over 300 objects for the exhibit, including paintings, prints, sculptures, precious stones, shells, and taxidermy, in order to recreate a fictive 17th century Dutch collector's cabinet. The result is a dialogue about the political and colonial histories of European collecting practices in the 17th century, which highlights problematic policies, beliefs, and visual representations. And now, a conversation about the politics of possession with curator Diva Samaya. Diva Samaya, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Art Sense podcast. Uh, Diva, you're the assistant curator in the Department of European Painting and Sculpture at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And I wanted to talk to you about a an exhibit coming up The World Made Wondrous, The Dutch Collector's Cabinet in the Politics of Possession, September 17th to March 3rd there at LACMA. From the title, I wasn't sure exactly what to expect when learning about the exhibit, but after learning more about the specifics of the exhibit, it's it's obvious you've provided a really interesting lens through which to view this work. And I guess the the real question for you is like, where do you even start to describe this exhibit? I mean, is it, is it a history lesson? I mean, where where do you start? Thanks for having me, Craig, um, and and thank you for your interest in the show. Um, it is a 17th century Dutch collector's cabinet, which some people may know through the term. I'm choosing not to use cabinet of curiosities. Um, it's probably a little bit better known. Um, but this type of collection, uh, I'm kind of assembling a fictional version of. Um, and it's a collection that had um, its origins in the 16th and 17th century across Europe. But I'm looking at the Dutch 17th century in particular. Uh, and in this collect these types of collections, they had art, natural specimens, um, so things we would traditionally see as art, quote unquote, like paintings, but then also like a lizard or a reptile or, you know, a brain in a jar. I don't have any brains, but in this show, but <laughs> just as an example. Um, and so that's uh, the type of collection I'm assembling. So that's kind of, I have to start by saying what it is, um, but then why, why am I doing this? Um, and I'm not just doing it to, to celebrate them or say they were great per se, although they are, of course, visually fascinating to learn about and see and encounter. Um, but I'm, I'm specifically doing this to criticize the early collecting history of European museums and to which many American museums are, are all indebted, and especially the encyclopedic museum. Um, and this type of collection is what gave birth and evolved into the museum. So that's why I'm kind of looking back at it and trying to pick it apart and so especially look at how they were political and colonial devices in the period in which they were assembled. I used to teach art history and when I would explain exactly what emerged from this period, I would always be speaking about how there was this newfound wealth and that in the art world and art history, you just follow the money, right? And, you know, mm-hmm. where where the church was the, the entity that was paying for all the art, now there's this newfound wealth. They were doing the acquiring and what were they looking for? You know, I don't think I ever got below that level of where was the money coming from? How were they acquiring that wealth? You talk about the Netherlands in terms of a strategic geography, in terms of a gateway to Europe, but in terms of exactly what was coming, the mechanisms for how that wealth was being garnered, and how they were judging what was considered a curiosity and what was given value and what wasn't, those are all really interesting things that I, I've never really spent a lot of time picking apart. So, you know, yeah. may, maybe you could help give us a little bit of background on what was the VOC and what was the WIC? So, so the VOC is the, the Dutch um, acronym for the Dutch East India Company, 
And the WIC is the Dutch acronym for the Dutch West India Company. So the East India Company was essentially the first um, corporation. um, And it was the first corporation to go around the world establishing monopolies on trade goods um, and conducting global trade on behalf of a government. So at the same time, it was governmentally like licensed. It was also its own private company uh, with shareholders and structured very much like the companies we know today. Um, but it was also given the government's, the government gave them the license to wage war, to enslave people, to establish colonies on indigenous land through force and violence or whatever means necessary, essentially. So um, you get all kinds of goods coming in through both of these companies, the West India Company being based in the Atlantic world and the East India Company being based in the Indian Ocean world um, with its headquarters in Batavia, which is now Jakarta and in, in Indonesia. Um, but yeah, you get all kinds of different goods coming in through like more, I guess we could say democratic forms of trade, like for instance, Chinese porcelain coming in through the East India, India Company, but then you get goods like nutmeg or spices coming in through really violent um, colonial means. Um, and the the difference between how all, they bring in all these different goods and which goods are valued and which ones the Dutch really want is, a, is an interesting question. One that I try to explore um, in the publication and through the show. It's a really interesting conversation. It's a it's a rather dark conversation that that has yeah. uh, a lot of religious undertones. Um, you know, this is a period where the Dutch aren't Catholic; they're Dutch Reformed Church Calvinist, and part of their worldview was kind of based around a European centric hierarchy of man. Can you talk more about how they viewed people groups that were on the outside and how they made determinations on whether they respected them as even mankind or not? Yeah, yeah. So it's a really fascinating time. And of course, the Netherlands is is actually quite diverse in terms of its religions, but and there's still a huge amount of Catholics um, present. However, the Calvinists kind of are the ruling class. Um, so they're the people with the wealth, the people making the decisions, writing the history. And uh, and for the most part, they're the people um, sailing the ships of the um, VSA and the WIC. So they're the people who are doing this colonialism for the most part. Um Yeah, it's really fascinating to look at how Calvinism, this really particular form of Protestantism that's um, popular amongst this class, predominates in this ideology, which I'm a fancy word for is anthropocentrism. But essentially, it means that they put man at the top of a pyramid and they put uh, plants and animals and all their forms of life below. Um, And it's quite literally a ranking. Um, Not all plants are created equal, and it's all judged by how proximate you are to humans. Um, And so you get this kind of ordering and categorizing of nature, um, which has its roots in antiquity and has its roots in the Bible. Um, But Calvinists actually take it up as a spiritual pursuit. Uh, And of course, there's something kind of beautiful about that on the one hand, where they're looking at God's creation. If you're religious, right, you might still think this way of looking at like a bouquet of flowers as sign of the diversity of God's creation and the abundance, right? Um, But then, as you mentioned, it takes kind of a dark turn when people start looking at people as not belonging (laughs) to humanity and instead plug somewhere else along this ladder, right? Um, And sometimes the reasons why people change status in the eyes of the Dutch uh, or Europeans writ large is that it's really a political and economic convenience. Um, For instance, in the 17th century, we see a shift around uh, blackness and the discussion of enslaved peoples being more and more exclusively thought of as black Africans. Uh, And they do a lot of sort of uh, ideological gymnastics to to kind of justify this. It's horrific. Um, But in the end, they kind of invent the the notion of blackness. They invent the notion of race um, in order to and and categorize these people as less than people or lower down this ranking in order to justify something that's tremendously economically beneficial to them. Um, so we see this happen in conjunction with political political and economic um, needs. I think quite a lot, but it's been happening since across the Middle Ages. You get. Um, you know, all kinds of medieval theological authors writing about monstrous races and people from, you know, supposed monstrous peoples who are kind of human, but not. Um, So we get this kind of a tradition that's been happening in Europe for a thousand years at this point, but then we see it really overlay with colonial political interests. It's interesting 
what criteria they were using to try to discern uh, between what yeah. people groups were monstrous or barbaric versus those that might be considered just a lower form of humanity. And, you know, for example, there were indigenous cultures that were not respected and open to slavery, but they sort of had some level of respect for uh, South Asia and, and China. But even then, no one was at the top of the heap like their European centric vision that they had. Right, right. It almost seemed like they were looking at what items these people had to trade as being some reflection of their place in society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think so. And I tried to kind of argue that in the book and um, talk about this relationship between the goods people had to that they produced and how Europeans evaluated those in tandem with the people themselves. Um, but yeah, it's really fascinating. And sometimes it does feel totally arbitrary um, from one indigenous group to the next um, across the world. You get completely different ideologies around them. Uh, and the Europeans at this time, I think, in the early modern period, it's not a generalization to say that they are obsessed with making. They're obsessed with craftsmanship and and high quality craftsmanship and these kinds of ideas so i think they do go into places saying okay what do you have for us you know and what what if, what do you make and for instance it's it's a fascinating case study about feather work in brazil because and in the americas in general because europeans are obsessed with this feather work but they look at it from a really connoisseurial standpoint that how well it's made which it is it's, it's made incredibly well um but they kind of miss the point about the the spiritual use of these garments or the meaning of birds and they don't really care about that right they care about these feathers are very well stitched um and so they value they put a little bit of like a, a teaspoon of praise on the people who make those for making them well but that's not enough to save their status as as humans or not in the end you know some of those folks do get subjugated and enslaved so you know the economic interests went out it wasn't just the dutch at this time i mean the the portuguese the spanish yeah. The British, there was a lot of trade going on. And when we look at the, the numbers of slave trade, the Dutch are responsible for their share of that. This is a, a pretty dark period when we think about exactly how uh, our interconnected world was, was developing. There was a bit of a colonial power grab going on at that time. I thought it was interesting. You you mentioned in the literature for the show about how, I guess, with this Calvinist ideal of predestination, they were they were less concerned with proselytizing or or being missionaries like the Catholics were, right. and that actually opened up some places like Japan, you know, which were closed off to you know Spain, Portugal, and the you know the the Catholics that were looking at extending these trade routes there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's fascinating how each version of colonialism that these different European entities are undertaking looks quite different and has kind of different priorities. Of course, in the end, it all comes down to the economic benefit back to the the motherland, you know, the home country, um, I think, across the board. But yeah, and for Spain and Portugal, you do get this sort of gloss, this kind of thing of, of conversion and saving people and, and winning, you know, masses of people to the true faith, to Catholicism, um, whether or not you can... People can argue about whether or not that was like the number one motive or, you know, it's probably economics, but that was definitely at play. And then you get um, the Dutch Protestant colonialism, which is much more economically motivated, of course, without something else coming into play. And like you said, that benefited them in certain cases because Japan did not was not interested in being converted any longer. The Portuguese kind of overstayed their welcome and didn't go well with them uh, for that reason. So it, it can it won their favor and then other times you know it kind of allowed them i think to more quickly write off certain groups of people as inhuman or we can just massacre this island right and it's um there's less at stake in terms of converting everyone um so it's it's interesting because a lot of times in my field um the more the, the less religious aspects uh, less re religious nature of Dutch colonialism has been used to cast it as somehow less bad than Spanish or Portuguese colonialism, or so, I don't know. I know it's, it's ridiculous to even say, but it's not. It's just different. Um, and there was definitely times where it it worked in their favor, and times where it had really dark consequences. 
I know that you have created an audio guide the, that goes along mm-hmm. with the exhibit uh, in lieu of uh, some of the wall text. I was wondering if you might be able to tell us about some of those contemporary voices you've included that help provide context and perspective. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I'm really, uh, it was a lot of work and I'm really passionate about what we were able to accomplish with the audio guide where we brought together 18 different speakers. um, And we did so because so often what's focused on in in this kind of topic is the collector uh, and these European wealthy men and and women and what they wanted or didn't want or kind of their tastes and their story. And I really wanted to sideline that as much as possible. Of course, I still address it in the in the publication, but um, in the in-gallery experience, I wanted to see what other kind of narratives we could draw out. So we have contemporary artists. Um, we have a lot of scientists, environmental historians. Um, I'm really excited about the partnership we developed with the Natural History Museum. So I learned so much from um, Aaron Celestian in mineral sciences, Jan Vendetti in malacology, for example. Um, I learned so much about shells <laughs> and gems <laughs> and Rhin- rhinoceros. And the rhinoceros from uh, Casey Bell um, there. So I had so much to learn from from my colleagues there. Uh, The contemporary artists were also really exciting to work with. um, And some of their work is in the show as well. So it's fantastic to have their voices overlaid um, in in the exhibition. You mentioned the Natural History Museum. And I thought that was another thing that struck me in the literature accompanying the show is how in the the sorting and classification, I mean, there was so much of what was going on during this time that was classifying. And in that classification, certain cultures wound up getting relegated to natural history museums, uh, yes. rather, th- which was just odd. You even referred to, to one particular installation at a fair, which was pretty much a people zoo. Of course, that happened over over centuries, but the the roots of that classifying, you know, are in yeah. these these cabinets. Exactly. Yeah, the roots of um, this categorization process are in the earliest collectors' cabinets already as sort of an ideology, as a process. Um, but then this, the actual formation of museums and then their separation into these distinct fields takes place more in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, but then you have all this ideology already in place to justify why you're putting what in, in which museum. Uh, and as you say, there's um, really from the start, actually, um, human beings are collected in uh, the collector's cabinet, quote unquote, alongside um, their body parts. It's, it gets really disturbing. Of course, things I could never have in my show or even gesture towards, right? Um, but an at- anatomical specimens that are locally collected are, are there, um, but then also uh, body parts collected in a, re- in a really colonial um, kind of gross, very gross way. Uh, and human beings are made to come back. Indigenous people from the Americas are made to come to, like, for instance, royal collections. Sometimes they're made to like reenact, like do indigenous native stuff that they do and like as a performance. Um, it's interesting. You can talk about the agency of those people as well and, and kind of make it more nuanced. Um, but when you get down to it, there is this impulse to collect everything, you know, not just the crabs and the shells, and, but human beings and to categorize them. Uh, and that continues well over the centuries. And as you said, there's this concept called human zoos, um, which is a pretty grotesque term, but it has a whole Wikipedia page, you know, um, check it out. And people of these cultures, indigenous and African uh peoples oftentimes were considered exhibitable, like like zoo animals, you know, because that's a really clear way of communicating these people are less human than we are. Um, and that continued until the 50s uh, in, some, in some world's fairs. So, and of course, we have these people's, you know, ancestors, which should be repatriated in some cases, most cases, uh, and their body parts um, in natural history museums very often still, and in ethnographic museums, as they're often called. Um, and and their cultural products, their art, right, is in natural history museums. And that's something I always found so fascinating. And I've kind of understood more through my research on this show um, that, you know, why we consider something art, high art, quote, unquote, unquote and, and not you know, ethnographic, it is really comes down to uh, comes down to these types of racist categorizing for efforts. One of the people on one of the audio guides had an interesting quote, and they said, you know, they take what they don't know to build what they do know. And maybe we can describe some of the pieces in the exhibit. Some of those pieces, you know, it's obvious that the objects aren't 
authentic to the society that they're coming from. It's almost like they've been commissioned for this European audience. Yeah, and that quote was from Raquel Tupinamba, who's a fantastic uh, indigenous leader of the Tupinamba people um, in the Amazon, uh, the Tapajoas River. And she's was absolutely fantastic. And I thought it was great that she turned things on its on their head and was talking about the European gaze is exotic and weird to her. <laughs> um, and, and she talked about, you know, the the way in which um, they're kind of plugging things into their existing frameworks. They're kind of taking things that they like or, or they already value and plugging it into uh, existing European frameworks of knowledge. Um, but to get to your point about kind of commissions or, or things that are produced for the European market, um, you do see that a lot with uh, lacquerware and with porcelain. Um, that's something that's really interesting to me. I don't have a Brazilian featherwork in the show <laughs> for, for many reasons, um, but uh, there are um, really interesting examples of porcelain that would never have been used in China or more, most likely would not have been. Um, and you have it uh, taking all these new strange forms and shapes for European desires, right? Like a, a neighbor bottle out of Chinese porcelain essentially um, is in the show. <laughs> a pair of bottles that essentially is designed after European gin and brandy um, liquor bottles and I'm just obsessed with them because they have this really fascinating form and their shape uh, and the way they were constructed is all related to um, to this new market that they were made for. Um, and so, so Europeans weren't didn't hesitate to put in special orders like, can you make this in your material, but in a form that we want? Um, so you get really interesting cases with uh, with porcelain for sure. Were, were all of the objects from LACMA's collection, or are these objects that were in the basement? About 170 or so objects um, in the show were from LACMA's permanent collection. And I'm lucky that uh, I'm, of course, at an encyclopedic, quote unquote, um, museum with a global collection. So I could work with almost every other department um, at the museum in order to make the show global appropriately to, um, to the collector's cabinet. And then I have... Um, a group of, I think, 11 or so lenders. I could be, uh, let's just say, I have, I have a large group of lenders um, as well for things like maps and books from the Getty Research Institute, things that we don't collect, um, scientific instruments from the Adler Planetarium, things that were important to have in the cabinet, but that we don't have anything like. Um, and of course, the Natural History Museum was a major partner, um, filling out things like you know the taxidermy and the shells and the gems, uh, and they've been incredibly generous. The show reminds me of an exhibit I saw at the Met last year called Fictions of Emancipation, where the Met was addressing issues of problematic depictions in the collection sort of head on. I mean, can you talk about creating a dialogue around problematic objects rather than just keeping them locked away? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess in in a way, this whole show is a problematic topic as well um, that I'm creating, trying to create a dialogue around. But there are objects within it as well that where I think that's taking place. Um, we have a really fascinating tapestry from uh, the 15th century that was in the Hearst collection, and it has a caricatured figure of a black person on it. Um, and this is something that, to my knowledge, hasn't really been dug into, but it's been fascinating to research and think about why this representation is there. What does that mean? It's something that gets really, really caricatured and out of hand in like the 18th and 19th century, say in porcelain, right? But to think about it in the 15th century already being present is so interesting. Um, so it is, uh, and that's, a, I'd, I'd say, a fairly mild example. Of course, there's images from the period uh, and also in maps and books I have in this show, there's some pretty bad um, imagery of the continents in which you see Africa um, imaged in a pretty racist way um, already. Again, it's, but I think what's so interesting to talk about and why they should be displayed with the appropriate context and information is that it's fascinating to look at things um, that we think of as racist stereotypes in the more modern period and to see that they're already present in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. Um, and to say, okay, well, what did it mean then? How did it evolve? You know, how did this conception, these racist ideas overlay with political, you know, changes? And it, I think it's really important because I'm I'm really passionate about drawing a straight line between the early modern, meaning the 1400 through 1700 and now. Uh, and I think it's important to see how long these ideas have been around and how how many forms they've taken. Well, I mean, I believe there was at least one landscape painting that made a, a plantation look like a tropical resort like White Lotus or something, right? 
That's a great way to put it. Yeah, Prince Posk. Do you think that providing a mechanism for analyzing the Dutch, does it allow the leap for people to turn a critical eye on themselves, on our own history, or even on our own contemporary culture? Yeah, absolutely. I think there we've seen so much in the United States recently, how much is at stake and how we talk about the 17th century and this history in the United States, uh, in, especially in, in the American history context, like with the 1619 Project, right, and all these really rigorous scholarly texts being labeled critical race theory, which of course is not like a bad word or anything, but um, we, we've seen this be kind of a, become a hot button issue, but it's fascinating because this is just history, right? This is just stuff that happened. Um, and so telling the 17th century history in, in a really accurate way and talking about enslavement has so many implications for the United States um, and also in quite a literal way, because of course the Dutch came to America, right? They're part of the colonial founders of this country. Um, so there's the history is very interconnected in terms of the Atlantic world. Um, their colony in Brazil also served as a model for what the British would do in the Americas and the Caribbean. Um, so there's a really direct one-to-one -one relationship historically um, between what the Dutch were doing and then the British to follow. Uh, but I, I think it's, yeah, there, it, I can't overstate enough how important it is that we, you know, reflect on the history of slavery, the history of, of colonialism and how many of those uh, structures have never ceased. You know, we're also talking about the 17th century in terms of the dawn of capitalism more and more and how all of these structures are interconnected. And so it's really important to look at how things never stopped. There's no like colonialism end date. Um, things just sort of took different forms. Uh, my understanding is that you have some contemporary work uh, in the show yeah. to provide contrast or, you know, a dialogue between the contemporary and, you know, this 17th century work. Can you talk a little bit about what those dialogues look like? Yeah, yeah. And there's only four. So I think I can briefly talk about them. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I didn't want so much that it would overwhelm, you know, the historical context. But it was important to me to also visualize this criticality that's going on, the critical dialogue to kind of interrupt um, histor historicity of the show that's otherwise, you know, kind of trying to recreate something historical in a way. Um, so we have an incredible work by LA-based artist Todd Gray, um, which really specifically addresses um, the Atlantic trade and enslaved peoples and the legacy of uh, this colonial mindset and this colonial um, exchange across the Atlantic. Um, and that's uh, really visually dynamic. Um, we also have a work I'm really excited that we acquired for the collection called um, The Last Forest by Weirda Sodoma, who's a Brazilian indigenous trans artist. And they are um, an incredible um, up and coming kind of emerging uh artist who works on Amazonian conservation, and they take on this spirit called Weirda, who's a tree, essentially, um, and this tree that walks, this tree that's embodied. Um, they do performances uh, and photo stage photos and photo series that kind of communicate the living, breathing nature of Mother Earth and of the Brazilian uh, rainforests. Uh, and, and I loved the contrast of their work um, really in making the deforestation of the Amazon about these murder of these living beings juxtaposed with Franz Poss, who you just mentioned makes Bra the Brazilian colony look like a resort, right? And it really objectifies the nature there um, for European consumers. There's also work by um, Dutch artist Satabole Malochua, um, who's a really fantastic, important artist doing important work to dissect Dutch colonial histories. And she does um, these fantastic photo collages based in historical research, um, dissecting and, and drawing out, uh, you know, the, the colonial history and the violent histories underneath images like still life, uh, for example. Uh, and then finally, we, we have a work by Jennifer Ling Dotchuk, who is a Chinese American ceramic based artist um, based in uh, Arizona. Uh, and she really does her work does a great job at enlivening and complicating the Chinese porcelain section because her works are, are porcelain, but they're kind of dealing with Chinese American identity and femininity and womanhood and all these different personal histories. Uh, and so I think it's a really beautiful set of a suite of uh, interventions, if you will, or conversations. You know, like we mentioned earlier, a lot of the pieces in the exhibit can be problematic. They are problematic. But are there a couple of pieces that you really found 
captured your imagination or your interest? I mean, were, were there pieces that you found to include that really captivated you? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I can share a few um, choices for sure. I mean, my, one of my first thoughts was the shells. We have a group of 12 shells um, from the Malacology Department of the Natural History Museum, and I learned so much about them. And of course, there's a, there are these um, there's a shell collecting craze in the 17th century Dutch Republic where people are, are, are you know, these wealthy men are, are assembling these shell collections. And to them, they mean all these different things about spirituality and God's divine order. And they have these contemplative thing, you know, exercises you can do around them. So they have this whole other set of meetings for, for these Dutch guys. But then on the other hand, here I am learning from this amazing malacologist, Jan Vandetti, about them as mollusks. And the fact alone that she referred to them as mollusks, like, kind of blew my mind because I'm so used to looking at shells as just a decorative art material. And I'm like, oh, wait, no, they're animals. You know, they're living mollusks um, at one point that had to be killed for for this. So it was really interesting to learn about the mollusks as animals. Um, Really fascinating. I kind of uh, was enamored by that. And then. I'd say I, I'm also like a Chinese porcelain super fan now. Like I'm also <laughs> obsessed. Same with lacquerware. Um, there's these, you know, immense, immense bodies of scholarship and knowledge and research on different types of porcelain forms and and uh, methods and making. And it was really amazing to learn from my colleagues uh, in Chinese art at LACMA about that um, and, and other colleagues as well um, and get a sense of, how these things were made, how many different markets they could be for. In Jingdezhen, in the cap- porcelain capital of China, they're making things for Japan that look quite different than what they're making for Portugal um, and very different than what they're making for the emperor right in his court. So you have these comp- this fascinating center of making where they're meeting all these different needs and they're doing so very expediently and they're making a bunch of money off the, the Dutch, right, who are just porcelain <laughs> crazed. Um, so I think that's a fascinating story. But yeah, I also enjoyed digging into the more difficult objects like the Franz Poss painting you mentioned of Dutch Brazil. Uh, and I have having heard, you know, the thoughts um, on that painting from a historian, Carolina Montero, who worked, uh, has worked uh, for many, many years on enslaved people in the Dutch colony, was fascinating, just as it was fascinating to hear from Weirda the with Sodoma, the artist I just mentioned uh, about, you know, how how they see that painting interacting with Brazilian nature and how they see biodiversity, right? They see their local biodiversity reflected in that painting. So it, it was incredible to dive into those objects that we can write off as problematic and say a sentence about how they misrepresent slavery, which is all true. Um, but then it was really cool to see how many more things we can pull out of it and how many more ways we can look at it. It seems like a wonderful uh, opportunity for people to come and engage and kind of put themselves in the shoes of a different time and kind of sort through uh, some messy, thorny issues that people are still wrestling with. And uh, again, uh, respect how much uh, work that it's obvious you've put into putting this show together. Uh, It's The World Made Wondrous, The Dutch Collector's Cabinet and the Politics of Possession. September 17th of this year to March 3rd of next year at LACMA. Diva, thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me about your hard work. And thank you for having me. It was really nice talking to you. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.